Perfect. Thank you very much. Great. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. My name is Sarah Clark. I'm the I'm the knowledge broker for Medify. I'm filling in for our usual host, uh, the Medify Med Medical Educator and Webinar Chair, Jennifer Wyman. Um, welcome to tonight's session on Ind Indigenous Culture as Healing. So we'll start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that the lands on which we're hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The work of Medify and our partners takes place on traditional territories of the Indigenous nations who have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Medify is located in Toronto on the ancestral homelands of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Attawandarans. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant. Medify is committed to reconciliation, and we recognize that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. We respect and embrace the rich cultural and traditional practice, practices of the ancestors, and we invite all of, uh, all of you here tonight to reflect on the territories where you're situated and to join us in committing to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. Just a couple of notes uh, about uh, the way that the webinar runs. If you have any questions or comments as, as uh, during the presentation, you can feel free to pop them into the chat box, um, making sure that you've selected uh, the everyone option rather than just hosts and panelists. And that way the chat will go to everyone who's participating. And also after the presentation, the last uh, roughly 30 minutes of the evening will be dedicated to interactive learning. Um, I'll be I'll be relaying the questions uh, that have been put in the chat verbally and also people have the opportunity uh, to raise their hand and speak if they wish to. At the end of the session, a uh, an evaluation form will be circulated for your completion. We really do appreciate your feedback on um, on the webinar. It helps us to plan for future sessions and and uh, it's it's really very helpful. And uh, you will also be receiving a letter of accreditation following um, following the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, following the webinar tonight. I'd like to thank uh, the 2024 webinar series committee members. And I'm, it's kind of good that Jennifer's not here that I can actually acknowledge the work that she has done in particular uh, on this webinar series. So thank you to uh, Jennifer Wyman in particular for uh, serving as chair, as well as Jennifer Brash, Katie Dunham, Pia Heikinen, Adam McInnes, JP Michael, Leslie Molnar, and Anko Ramanathan. Thank you very much to all of our committee members. Just to give you, uh, this is our this is our last um, scheduled webinar webinar for the the season so far. We will be having um, more webinars in the future that are still being planned. So this is just sort of a a taste and upcoming uh, some topics to tantalize you, and we will be announcing the schedule uh, as soon as it's set. And with that, uh, I will just uh, as we all probably know. June is National Indigenous History Month, which is a time to celebrate the many unique cultures, practices, traditions, and achievements of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. And it's in that context that I'm particularly welcome to be, uh, to, excuse me, particularly delighted to be welcoming Dr. Carol Hopkins, who will be speaking to us tonight about Indigenous culture as healing. Carol Hopkins is the Chief Executive Officer of the Thunderbird Pound, Thunderbird. Pound, Partnership Foundation, and is of the Lenape Nation, Canada. Carol was appointed as an officer in the Order of Canada 2018. In 2019, she received an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from Western University. Carol has spent more than 25 years in the field of First Nations substance use and mental health. She holds both a Master of Social Work degree from the University of Toronto and a degree in Medewin, equivalent to a PhD in Western-based education systems. Medewin is a sacred medicine society where she is also a chief and leader and the source of sacred Indigenous knowledge, which Carol then translates into accessible means to inform mental wellness of First Nations. Carol has throughout her career made use of Indigenous indigenous knowledge in research, policy, practice-based evidence, teaching and education, and in facilitating processes of decolonization specific to epistemic racism. 
She has co-chaired national initiatives known for best practice in national policy review and development. Her leadership has been engaged within health and mental health for First Nations, provincial, territorial, and federal governments, serving several expert advisory committees and task groups. Carol, uh, thank you so much for being here with us this evening, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And um, just waiting for my slides. Okay, thank you. Um, we want to show no gem and digna cause gaye mahinga and dodem on a lanape que and dow lanape a king and donjaba nikabe mede que. Good evening. I'm Carol Hopkins, and I'm also the uh, CEO at Thunderbird Partnership Foundation. And I am joining you from the lands of the Lanape people here in southwestern Ontario, where it's very, very warm. And I expect in many places where you are also joining from. Um, <clears throat> the presentation focuses on uh, how Indigenous culture, specifically First Nations culture, um, is instrumental for healing and wellness. And I have uh, no financial uh, disclosures to um, make at this time. And um, other than I am an employee of Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, which is a division of the National Native Addictions Partnership Foundation. And... Um, what I hope to impart this evening is um, to provide an understanding of foundation for um, the importance of culture in uh, addressing substance use, um, more specifically uh, addictions treatment. And I want to rely on the Indigenous wellness framework and uh, the research that we did to develop the Indigenous Wellness Framework, which also talks about common cultural interventions across First Nations of Canada. And then um, give you an example about how land-based service delivery is um, an element of, of cultural practices that facilitates healing and wellness. And the first question I have for you, or I'd like to um, introduce is uh, what does Indigenous knowledge mean to you or what is culture-based evidence and have you heard of those concepts and I invite you to share your thoughts in the chat as we continue the conversation um, so again what is Indigenous knowledge and what is culture-based evidence Just like in, in Western knowledge uh, development uh, systems, um, sacred knowledge, we understand, um, is also important for um, healing and wellness. And in both knowledge systems, worldviews, there always has to be a way of identifying where that knowledge comes from, what is the source, and how it can be relied upon. And so <clears throat> there are a number of different ways of uh, talking about the origin of knowledge. And this is critically important to all of our work because we want to ensure that whatever we are employing um, to inform our practice, it uh, can be relied upon. And so from a Western worldview, uh, we understand that we all have different theories or there are many theories for supporting healing and wellness for addressing substance use or the harms uh, from substance use. And <clears throat> so we have different approaches then that are de developed from those theories. And as we test those theories and those approaches, um, we are carefully documenting what we are doing to ensure that we are able to communicate that with others through uh, publications. And in those publications, the authors of the publication become the owners of that knowledge or the author, they have authorship of that knowledge. And then once it's out in the public domain, it's open for testing and retesting to de determine validity, always citing the original authors or the changes that are made over time. 
Well, with sacred indigenous knowledge, and I use the word indigenous, not in the context of, um, as it's defined by government. Um, so indigenous means people of the land. Um, government has used this term um, over time, the term to group uh, the uh, people that um, the government has referred to as Indian, Native, Aboriginal, and now um, using the term Indigenous to group Métis, Inuit, and First Nations all together under one title. I use the word Indigenous as um, not referring to all of uh, those populations, but to refer to uh, indigenous people as people of the land um, here on Turtle Island. And so uh, from the sacred societies of indigenous people of Turtle Island, um, we have sacred knowledge. And that original knowledge um, is knowledge that has been given by the spirit. And so that's why we call it sacred knowledge. And it's carried uh, by the student of that knowledge or teachers um, and the teachers of that knowledge um, carry that in trust for the future. They never become the owners. Um, and each generation of people that walks the land of Turtle Island learns how to translate that knowledge into its current uh, um sorry, translates that knowledge into current context. So the way that my ancestors would have used the knowledge of the story of origin, our story of creation, um, that story is has remained constant and intact, but how it's translated and applied has changed across generations, um, essentially because of the change in our environments. So <clears throat> the origin of the story stays the same. The teaching, the knowledge stays the same, but the way it's translated, made accessible, um, changes over time so that it can be applied in all contexts. And then the citation for that knowledge is to the teachers or the sacred society. And so I was introduced with uh, my in, as part of my identity as Medewin, and I said that in the language as well. And Medewin is a sacred medicine society. And my teachers are the society specifically of the Medewin Lodge that I belong to is the Three Fires Medewin Lodge. There are many, many, many Medewin lodges across this land. And the Grand Chief of the Three Fires Medewin Society who has continued this knowledge across many, many generations, has now also um, uh, traveled on to the spirit realm. His name was uh, Badwewin and Benesi Aban, uh, Eddie Benton Benay. And, and now we are working with uh, our spiritual leader is on Ona Benesi, uh, also known as, he holds a position as Gitche Aya, uh, meaning that he is the teacher of all teachers, um, he's the elder of all elders. He is our spiritual link. And so those are my teachers. That's a sacred society um, that has uh, validated my learning and my understanding um, and supported the translation of that through my work um, in addictions and substance use. So there's a there's a parallel between Western-based knowledge systems and sacred knowledge systems. I, I can't walk into a university and claim a master's degree. I can't walk into a Medewin society and claim a leadership role. Um, that's, uh, there are certain processes in each society and each knowledge system for um, gaining knowledge, for application of knowledge, and for um, validating the translation and, and application of knowledge. So I think this is important to translate because it starts to break down um, 
or to cause question to arise. And um, that eventually breaks down um, what I refer to as epistemic racism. And that's the judgment of, uh, without knowing, the judgment of knowledge systems as invalid, um, not relevant, um, not credible. And um, and so the process of, of acquiring knowledge and for developing knowledge is critically important to understanding the place of culture um, within healing and wellness for First Nations people. And I refer to First Nations specifically because Thunderbird Partnership Foundation does not have a mandate from uh, Métis uh, Nation or uh, the Inuit population. We do have a, a partnership with uh, the government of Nunavut and are, are starting to do some work in that um in that territory with, with Inuit populations from Nunavut. But much of our work is based on First Nations. And so sacred knowledge is, is the original knowledge that is given to us by the spirit. We didn't derive in this creation on Turtle Island um, void of any understanding or knowledge about how to live in and with with creation, um, how to live as people. And so in our our um, creation story, as it's called also, known as our origin story, is the foundation for our worldview. It's also the foundation for all of our evidence. Everything that we have as First Nations people can be traced back um, to the story of creation or story of origin. And that's one of the ways um, that we validate knowledge and teachings from um, that are that are given by the spirit. Um, so throughout time and as a continuance of the creation story, life unfolds and there's a forever pattern that unfolds that we can also rely on for tracing evidence, for tracing um, truth um, and knowledge that we, continue to live with. And so our teachers have always said that knowledge is, is just knowledge unless you put it to use. And it's how you put it to use. It, um, that is critically important to ensure that it's relevant uh, to, the, to the people of the land. And so there isn't just one sacred knowledge. There isn't just one story of creation. One thing that is distinct and different from Western knowledge and indigenous knowledge or sacred knowledge is that you um, in amongst First Nations people, there are many different cultures because there are 51 different uh, languages within the uh, Algonquin language family. And there are 11, at least 11 language families um, across North America on, tur on Turtle Island. The Anishinaabek uh, language or the um, what is known as Anishinaabek language within the Algonquin language family is one of the largest languages, uh, language groupings that represents uh, a number of different nations of people. And so across the 11 language families, and the languages that are within the language, one language family, such as Anishinaabek Nation or Algonquin uh, language speaking peoples, they have their story of creation. And there are similarities between the stories, but their stories are also different. And they're different because of the land and the territory in which they live. But it's also true that all creation stories are true, even though they are different. And so we don't have a practice of challenging or debating um, the foundation of the evidence, which is the story of creation, story of origin, as is the case in Western knowledge systems. We're always testing and retesting or challenging or finding, does it apply across genders? Does it apply across 
age of populations? Does it apply across uh, certain different cultures? That's one of our practices in Western-based knowledge systems. In indigenous knowledge systems, there's no debate uh, between the creation stories. Um, there is ability to question the interpretation and translation of the creation story as it applies to the current environment and current context. And so that practice of translation is always uh, meant, um, modified or um, the practice of knowledge translation is with the intention of ensuring accuracy and truth. Now, truth and evidence don't always sit side by side. Um, but when it comes to our story of origin, our story of creation, we always talk about that as being the truth of all life. And so we want to make sure that what we translate is the fullness um, and that it's accurately applied to our current context. And the way to do that most fully is with our languages, our original languages, our indigenous languages. There is no possible way to fully translate from indigenous language, which holds the fullness of our, our story of creation to the English language. Um, we also have in our sacred societies, our sacred imagery, our, our scrolls and our records um, are also part of the holding uh, the fullness of that knowledge system. And so that the fullness of the knowledge and all of the ways that it's it's been held intact through our language, through imagery, through different records that we have, um, we always need to know where is the source um, and how it's transmitted and how this sacred society holds that knowledge. Now, <clears throat> how is all of this relevant to substance use? Well, when we think about substance use, we think about the way that it changes our um, our being. And it's necessary to think about individual beings, a human being, from mind, body, spirit, and emotions. And so that's one of the pieces of information or knowledge that is set aside in Western-based systems is the spirit. And um, we offer many, many different ways and approaches uh, to supporting individuals who are dependent upon substances for living every single day. Some of us um, only practice from a, a physical perspective. Um, what are the medications perhaps that are needed to address the sickness of the dependency when, when their uh, access to the substance of choice is not available? But just as it affects the physical being, it also has an effect on the way that that individual thinks about themselves and others also affects how they feel about themselves and others and their place in the world and definitely affects them at the level of their spirit. And so I want to talk to you about that. Um, so indigenous knowledge is the translation of sacred knowledge. So that sacred knowledge is held for indigenous people. It's not available uh, publicly. It's not um, in most sacred societies. It can't be accessed other uh, by anyone other than um, that nation of people. And again, the learning of that sacred knowledge is to inform, uh, just like our university degrees. Uh, my background is in social work. How do I apply what I learned in social work to my work uh, related to substance use? And for all, all of you online, you studied a certain uh, prof in a pr certain profession, and then you learn to apply that to the population that you're serving. Same thing. How do we apply? Um, the translation of sacred knowledge to make it as accessible to First Nations people primarily um, to support their healing and wellness. And so um, Elder uh, Jim Dumont, his, his, uh, 
his spirit name is Onabanese. Um, he talks about the concept of indigenous intelligence, uh, which is the wise, he describes as the wise and conscientious embodiment of exemplary knowledge and the use of this knowledge in a good, beneficial, and meaningful way. And so, unfortunately, um, we've, as Indigenous people, have experienced the um, misappropriation of knowledge. And that misappropriation of knowledge has been for personal gain in some kind of way um, through status or or finance, uh, financial benefit. It hasn't been always uh, protected and kept um, for Indigenous people um, held in trust uh, for the future um, that relies on this, this way of knowing. And so... Um, the way it's translated uh, oftentimes is in very rigid ways with rules about things that are supposed to be done. So the scope of practice, for example, there are certain ways of doing things, but there has to be meaning to the way that things are done, not just a rule so to say, well, you go around the circle this way. No, I've heard you go around the circle that way. Or I've ho heard that only men can do this and women cannot. There has to be meaning behind whatever is being translated as the way. Otherwise, then you're not careful enough to understand um, and convey meaning. And what could be conveyed instead is confusion. And confusion is a sickness. And so there's um, in sacred societies and in the translation and monitoring of the translation of sacred indigenous knowledge, there's careful attention uh, by the teachers, leaders of this, of the sacred societies, or even the elders in community who also hold knowledge from one generation to the next um, that is specific to a community. And the knowledge of their medicine, the plants that grew on their land, that um, and that knowledge that has been passed through generations, the knowledge of the beings of creation, all of the all of the animals um, that live in creation, uh, that knowledge is is critically important uh, to wellness because it also informs part of our identity and our place of belonging. And so, when we hold that knowledge it again always has to be applied with attention to the future and as as well uh, attention to the future because we want to preserve the truth of of that teaching and that knowledge so that the truth goes into the future for their translation um, rather than rules and so the these are things that we face today that is that are not um indigenous intelligence but um, the um, knowledge acquisition for personal gain, uh, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so when we talk about the importance of evidence uh, in Western-based society, you want to make sure that um, there's good knowledge around the medicine that is needed to address the dependency of whatever substance an individual might um, be using. Likewise, in Indigenous knowledge systems, we want to be sure about the medication of we're also wanting to be sure about the knowledge and how that knowledge was transferred, where did it come from, who carried that knowledge, so that we can also be sure we can um, be clear that we can depend upon the knowledge that, that's being shared and not just um, often what's often described as folklore or um, home remedies or um, things of that nature that imply uh, something that is not evidence-based. And so part of, um, or one model that uses um, Indigenous knowledge, promotes Indigenous knowledge, is the First Nations Mental Wellness Continuum Framework. And this model was developed in conversation with First Nations people across Canada. 
And there are a number of different themes. There's actually five themes that go along with the mental wellness continuum framework. But the first and primary theme is culture as the foundation. Now you see the background color is consistently um, what we describe as PEI red. It's the color of the people of this land. That's what it's meant to represent. So culture as the foundation means understanding concepts from the original language of First Nations people, understanding how that language informs practices, informs ceremonies, informs knowledge, informs land, um, our value system, who are the carriers of that knowledge, such as elders and cultural practitioners, and the importance of our relationships, our kinship relationships, um, not only with people, what, but with um, land and environment as well. That's the foundation, meaning that's the starting place for conversation. And it might be difficult to understand how culture is the foundation has anything to do with the sickness of um, the withdrawals from dependency on certain drugs. But again, um, in 2011, when uh, the Honoring Our Strengths a Renewed Framework to Address Substance Use Amongst First Nations in Canada was released, it was released with principles that were defined by elders and knowledge keepers from across Canada, from across different cultures, who we asked what advice they could give us in addressing substance use from the foundation of culture, from the foundation of Indigenous knowledge. So knowledge is, is one thing. Culture is the practice of that knowledge. It's Culture is the way of life. It's the way of doing and being. And so they, what, they talked for a couple of days. And at the end of those two days, what we had were a number of principles. And the first principle they put forward is that whatever we do, it has to be spirit-centered. And so culture as the foundation means attending to the spirit not leaving it out, not segregating um, or leaving uh, someone else to take care of the spirit. Culture as the foundation means attending to the spirit. And that might be through the use of language, through the use of different culture practices. And, um, and then the other uh, themes are um, that whatever we do, we have to support community development. Community has to own their own solutions. They have the knowledge. They often do not have capacity. And so supporting capacity development, community development in whatever we do. The third one is quality. Quality care systems and competent service delivery are critical to ensuring wellness, not just things make that we make up. <laughs> it's um, making sure that we can rely on um, the culture-based practices that are being put forward. And that's that takes practice because of colonization. There has been a divide in our, our access to our own knowledge, to our language, to our culture-based practices. And certainly even further um, separated from the ability to interpret the knowledge that our language languages hold um, the knowledge that we have in living uh, life from Indigenous worldviews um, to see how that can be applied in present day context. But one thing that has been constant and has not been lost or uh, we've been separated from is that our identity matters and we need our language and our culture to so facilitate wellness. It's just how do we practice culture? How do we interpret that? That's the skill that is being developed um, uh, in, in across communities now. And that also another theme of the mental wellness continuum framework is that we have to collaborate. There's not enough of us to do this alone. And that we have to have partners, well-meaning partners that align with uh, Indigenous worldviews are not going to come along and say, 
that doesn't have any evidence base. Uh, so we can't fund it or um, I can't work with elders and cultural practitioners because I don't understand their credentials or their scope of practice or who sanctions their scope of practice. Um, we need collaboration with allies and partners who can respect and the word respect means lots of different things to people. Um, and from within an Indigenous worldview, it means looking at things uh, from more than one perspective and appreciating that differences are okay. Not everybody has to think the same. And so the fifth uh, theme of this uh, model is enhanced flexible funding across Canada. Uh, there is no continuum of care that is available to First Nations people in First Nations communities. And so we rely on uh, many different partners and um, most uh, people in Canada or most professional associations often think that substance use and addictions are covered off by the federal government when it comes to First Nations. That's not true. There are pieces of the continuum where provinces and territories hold responsibility. And, and so we use these models, the mental wellness continuum framework, also the honoring our strengths from a renewed framework to address substance use as models to facilitate an open conversation across different government uh, jurisdictions, but also with professional associations, uh, such as the Medify Group, as, as well as others, to facilitate an understanding about a model that First Nations people have developed and put forward as um, a way of thinking about how to serve First Nations. Finally, First Nations people said that Whatever we invest in mental wellness should be measured by hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these four outcomes, but you see them sitting at the center of the model. And um, I also want to say that that a kind of sage green circle uh, describes populations. And then the orange circle outside of the sage describes the unique needs that are a priority across these populations. And then the blue is identifying the specific forms of, of care that are necessary. Now, this model was developed and released in 2015 when we we're still using the word detox. Um, not that detox is not relevant, but it's not the only solution. And also, um, you know, depending on the government of the day, whether we were able to use harm reduction, thank goodness, um, the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs um, passed a resolution uh, for harm reduction. So uh, worldwide now, uh, there's um, more openness to harm reduction as a method, a model of care. So in this research that we conducted on to, that developed the hope, belonging, meaning, wellness, uh, sorry, hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose, um, which is an, an Indigenous wellness framework in itself, we defined wellness from an Indigenous lens. And when we asked uh, what creates a whole and healthy person, First Nations across the country said, it is our physical being, our mental wellness, our emotional wellness, and spiritual wellness. We have to attend to all aspects of our being if we want to uh, create wellness. And it recognizes that the spirit causes us to live. It's our life source. It's what gives us vitality, mobility, purpose, and desire to achieve the highest quality of living in the world. And so when the elders said uh, spirit centered, that's what they were talking about is because the spirit is what makes the rest of our being um, come to life, our emotions, our mental well-being and our physical well-being. And, and then we asked if, if we use culture um, to address substance use, 
what are the cultural practices, again, across the country, across different language groups, across different cultures, what are the common cultural interventions? What are the co uh, cultural interventions that you use to support wellness um, for people who use substance? And I want to clarify that when I use the word wellness, I'm not, I'm not meaning abstinence. Wellness does not mean strictly abstinence. Wellness means that you are well, even though you might have a level of dependency on drugs, you might have a level of sickness or other um, um, health statuses that comp compromise um, your ability to function. You still have wellness because you have a spirit. And so wellness will show up in many different ways. So the common cultural interventions that were described, um, again, across the country, they varied but we didn't debate, we didn't argue, we didn't challenge that, you know, the story that is told um, on Vancouver Island is more important than the story that is told by the Mi'kmaq people on the East Coast. It's their storytelling is their way of conveying knowledge, transferring knowledge from one generation to the next. And what's critically important for all of these cultural practices is the language of the people. It's central to interpreting and applying these um, activities within residential treatment or community-based services. Um, and it's critically important that community is, is involved in one way or another. So the Indigenous Wellness Framework um, is um, hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. These four outcomes were, again, a result of the conversation that we had with First Nations people across the country. When we asked them, who is a health, whole and healthy person? They said, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical wellness, a balance across those four aspects of our being. And then they said, we asked them, the cultural practices to facilitate that wellness. That was a previous slide. And then we said, from your own knowledge, your sacred knowledge, your community-based knowledge of your culture and your way of being, what are the outcomes that we should expect to see as a result of using culture to facilitate wellness? And so as a result of that conversation, we have 13 different indicators that lead to the outcomes of hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. And so spiritual behavior is expressed through understanding values that are unique to Indigenous people. Again, one of those values being family and community and then individual. Now, um, as a result of colonization, we see a lot of behavior where that has been flipped and it's the individual that is more prominent. When <clears throat> we are living according to our values and our beliefs and our identity, our concern is for family and community first and then me last. And so what do I do? Um, for example, what do I do? How do I live? How am I with uh, my family and community? What am I contributing? What in what ways is the work that I do facilitating or contributing to others? Again, it's the preservation of our way of being for the future. Those are inherent values. Uh, there are other inherent values, again, from our, our stories of creation, our stories of origin, that the creator gave to us the gifts of kindness, caring, honesty, and strength. And that we come in, our spirit comes into this world carrying those gifts. But those gifts get covered up by our experience of, of colonization, of racism, oppression, uh, discrimination, all of those kinds of experiences that are trauma-based experiences that communities have not had capacity, have not had equitable resources to fully address in the context of laws that prevented us from using our own culture and knowledge. But now we're living in a time where 
those things are actually legal. And uh, there's legislation in Canada now that we know as the UN Rights of Indigenous Peoples is now legislation in Canada. So how do we practice that um, in the context of reconciliation? How does reconciliation facilitate our understanding or making space um, for safe space for the use of culture and Indigenous knowledge? Emotional behavior is expressed through that connection, again, to family and community, having relationship not only with people, but with land and environment, and having an attitude towards living life. Um, we know that suicide rates are higher amongst Indigenous people than the Canadian population. Again, the results of colonization, all of the forms of colonization have have created um, all of those um, stats that talk about the deficits that First Nations people face, but those deficits are not our identity. And there is still possibility and there's hope for facilitating difference. And I think about the Indigenous people who sleep on the streets are dependent upon different types of substances uh, to just cope with life. And the opportunities that we um, have and missed and the opportunities that we want to create for helping people to understand that no matter how they live or the situation they find themselves in, they still have a spirit that was given by the great spirit. And so they have uh, a purpose in life and their life continues to have meaning. And so the purpose of developing the Indigenous Wellness Framework is so that we could start to collect evidence um, about the difference that culture makes. And so, again, going back to the Honoring Our Strengths Renewal Framework that was released in 2011, there's a chapter on research. And that chapter said, again, represents the First Nations voice, said that we do want to do research, but we want to do research that demonstrates the strength of First Nations people. We want to tell the story about what's right with us rather than the story about what's wrong with us. Not that, you know, we can ever get away from the assessments that says, how bad is it now? But we want to get to the assessments that demonstrate the culture matters and culture does make a difference. And so we developed the Native Wellness Assessment. And there's two forms. There's the self-assessment and then there's the observer assessment, which is the helper or professional that is supporting an individual having access to culture. So if they're in um, a program in a community for rapid access to addictions medicine alone, this is not the right tool to use for that. If they are doing rapid access to addictions medicine and they have access to, to culture um, to facilitate, to work alongside that medication, then this is uh, this form can be useful. This assessment can be useful. So it's a a class B assessment has good psychometrics, um, and it's uh, been validated for test retest uh, to give you a reliable measure of change. Here are some questions: um, My native culture fuels my desire to live a good life, and that's talking about identity. And so, if um, a community-based program wants to use the Native Wellness Assessment as well as an, an assessment to assess trauma, mental health, substance use uh, severity, then they um, can contact Thunderbird Partnership Foundation and we can facilitate uh, a First Nation or Inuit community's access to what we call the Ad National Addictions Management Information System and where they can get access to this two assessments, it's a case management system, produces automated reports. If people want to use the native wellness assessment alone, that too is possible. It's more timely, however, because um, you have to send us um, either electronically or by mail the assessments in order for us to produce the report. Um, and that's to ensure that Thunderbird continues to collect the data and produce 
reports. And so this is an example of one of the reports that we, we drew from the data in the addictions management information system that is um, most commonly used by uh, live-in treatment centers, but they also are now offering outpatient virtual services, outreach services. Um, and so we filtered data from uh, March, 2020 to January, 21. And, and so just as we, before we start looking at this data, um, think about what is the, what is the value? What value is there for demonstrating the significance of language, worldview and culture? And I, I hope I, I've made that, that uh, pretty obvious to you. Um, we, we've heard from government, you know, government has said, First Nations tell us they, they need funding for land-based um, interventions, land-based healing, land-based camps, being out on the land, different ways of talking about land. And, and they said, well, we don't really understand what that means. And when we, we ask, can you tell us more about that? Sometimes First Nations have a have some difficulty in explaining what that means. And so we developed a land uh, for healing service delivery model to translate again that concept and bring together land and um, its purpose in substance use uh, or uh, facilitating wellness from the harms of substance use. And so it, it can be culture specific life skills and there's lots of different examples of the ways communities have used land to facilitate healing and wellness, along with community-based um, programs uh, that address the sickness from dependency on substances um, in the uh, as people are withdrawing from them. So <clears throat> this is the data um, that, again, from 2017 to 2020, we looked at. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of it, except for what you will see on the screen is that consistently across the three years that we looked at the data. Now, this was looking at all of the common cultural interventions that have to do with land and people who presented uh, for treatment uh, for uh, a substance use dependency. And they consistently showed progress in the areas of belonging and purpose. Now, if you remember from the Indigenous Wellness Framework, belonging is that connection, the relationship with land and environment, and family and community, having an attitude towards life. And purpose is understanding a unique way of living and being in the world that creates wholeness. And so these two, these two, um, aspects of uh, the Indigenous Wellness Framework work to balance each other. And there are three different uh, categories of cultural practices, the things that we do on a daily basis, then things that are um, more infrequent, maybe we weekly or monthly, and then category three, which is more seasonal or ceremonial specific. And so the Indigenous Wellness Framework or the Native Wellness Assessment measures um, the difference in hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose, but it also measures the difference in your connection to culture. And uh, so across the three years, there's consistently growth in an individual's connection to culture. And so, again, the two areas that uh, showed the most prominent differences in uh, belonging and in purpose. And I was quite excited when I seen these results because we're talking about land and land fits uh, very well within the indicators of um, emotional wellness. Um, this model might be a little bit different, difficult to see on the screen, but uh, the importance of it is that the community is the hub. So for First Nations people, um, you know, in Ontario, for example, um, overrepresented in the deaths um, from drug poisoning. And um, 
And that's because we don't have community-based services. We don't have community-based harm reduction services. We don't have uh, capacity to um, uh, for public health measures, such as putting together harm reduction kits um, and, and uh, on a continuous basis and then uh, distributing those to community. First Nations people who want access to harm reduction services has meant that they have to travel um, outside of the community someplace to get those, to get access to either to medication or sterile equipment. Community has to be the hub and other services that the community needs, again, like the mental wellness continuum framework, need to come into community in order to ensure the culture is the foundation, the right environment. Now, I know maybe you're thinking not all First Nations support harm reduction, and that's where community development and capacity building comes into play. I've heard that often. Communities, leadership, elders don't support harm reduction. But when I talk to them about what harm reduction means, saving a life, preserving lives, preserving the sacred breath of life, which is a program that airs on APTN on Sunday evenings at 530, um, check it out. When we talk about these things, it creates an understanding and it starts to uh, shift that thinking that is abstinence-based. It's only one way um, to creating an understanding about the harms of substance use and that these are our relatives, they're our family, and they deserve, they have the right uh, to prevention, to treatment, to early intervention. Community has to be the hub. Um, and it isn't just one uh, type of service that will benefit First Nations people in addressing addictions. It's many, many um, that play a role. And one common characteristic that's necessary amongst all of the facilitators of wellness that may be serving a community is collaboration. Um, collaboration in a uh, community development approach, understand the community and, um, you know, sharing those perspectives uh, across the different lenses. And that's it. Um, and so I'll, I'll take down the slides and I believe we'll move on to perhaps questions, dialogue. Jamie Wedge, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I There was a, a lot that came up for me that didn't quite ever coalesce into a question, I don't think, but there were just a couple of, of my own um, musings, I suppose, that, that, that came up that I'd love to get, I guess, share with the group and, and encourage other people to share as well. Um, the in in the model the the first nations mental mental wellness continuum model it is so extraordinary to have hope belonging meaning and purpose as your outcomes as the things that you are measuring to to actually demonstrate the effectiveness of of the interventions it 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 seems so natural that those would be that they're they're such fundamental things and to actually put them into practice in this type of, of, of model, I think, is, is so uh, striking to me. And is, is this model, um, has, it, has it been adopted widely? Like, is, is, there, is it being used? Is it, is there, has there been a lot of uptake of it? Yes, um, there has. Um, in, uh, so amongst treatment centers, for sure, uh, but also in community. So... Um, I'll give you some examples. A community that um, was supporting the implementation of a harm reduction model or um, a suboxone program in their community. They gained partnership with um, prescribers that were able to, to travel to the community um, to induct folks on suboxone. And they also were able to support a number of people with lived experience. And, um, and through that collaboration, getting to understand the community, um, they decided that what they needed to do was to have a 
feast for um, the individuals who were going to be inducted um, into the Suboxone program. And so there was the Western-based medicine and the Indigenous medicine, which was the feast, which is like a potluck f- lunch kind of thing, except for they make a plate of food. And that plate of food is for their ancestors. Or, um, it's for the spirit, for the great spirit. So you're feeding the spirit and you're saying, we want to recognize these individuals for their courage uh, to start a new journey. You're not making a, a commitment to abstinence. You're recognizing them for their courage to start a new journey. And that's a huge effort towards destigmatizing um, individuals who might have been seen in a different way in the community. And um, it's two medicines coming together. Um, so there's one example. Um, others are things like, again, the belonging in the community. Uh, individuals, so a community would put together a small fund. And when there were uh, different jobs that were needed in the community, um, people who were um, who had access were being stable. They were stabilizing their life. Um, they would be called upon, and so they were seen in the community as helpers. They were, you know, fixing fences or fixing signposts, or they were fixing, doing odd jobs around the community. Again, increasing vis- visualization uh, of folks who were in the process of um, doing something different to manage uh, their their drug dependency. So increasing vis- visualization, um, reinforcing that connection uh, and belonging in community. Um, another community had a volunteer who knew uh, medicines and was well known in community for knowledge of medicines. And they you know, in a community conversation said, um, you know, I'll take uh, people who want to know and understand the purpose of medicines. And, um, and so that's what they did was, and it wasn't just the person who was in, um, in the Suboxone program. It was that person plus their family, if they had children, if they had a significant other, they were all invited to go out on the land uh, for these teachings and experiences of learning the medicines, picking the medicines, preparing the medicines, um, all of that activity was family-based as, as well as while they're participating in the Suboxone program. And so it's all geared towards using um, the themes of, or the outcomes of hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose to come up with these creative ideas about how to connect people to secure their connection uh, to life. Yeah, that that inter the interconnectedness of that model is is uh, is really there. There, I think there are so many ways. As as you've been saying, there's so many ways to bring those things together. Something that you just said about the about the ser- this like taking the suboxone. Uh, as part of the feast and acknowledging the person's bravery for that moment, not that they are necessarily committing to abstinence. That reminded me of something that you said earlier about you can have wellness despite having sickness. And I think there's a there's a vet, and this is I, this is just my personal opinion, but I, I think there's a there's a a very Western, almost cult of health where where health is is there's almost a moral like we equate health with morality but some right. people are sick like it's sickness is is a thing that happens and uh, to varying degrees for varying lengths of time to everybody and i think that this focus on wellness really promotes the idea like if you bring it back you what you said was you can you can have wellness because you have spirit yes um, and where and the the importance and centrality of that I think yes. it's really amazing. It's not all or nothing. It's not black and white either, or it's the whole person and the whole person is never in their totality sick. Um, they always have an element of wellness. And I, I see in the chat, there's a question about using things like smudging 
um, while they're using substances. So <clears throat> while they're using substances um, to get high, um, to maintain uh, their, you know, um, while they're using substances uh, to cope with life, for example, um, yeah, there are many cultures across the land that will say, if you're not um, coherent with what's happening around you, then you don't get the full benefit. Um, so if there is something blocking your ability to fully believe in the medicines that you are using, then you're not going to get the full benefit. It's not like you're going to die if you smudge and you're high. Um, we don't have that kind of thinking of, again, um, the moral judgment of, you know, you're, you're going to, um, that all or nothing kind of thinking, but there is what is true. And first and foremost is respect. So if you have the respect for the medicine, so if you have a dependency on opioids and your dependency is, is what you intend uh, to maintain. So every day you're going to use opioids um, and you're, you're presenting as though you're high and you're going, and that's how you live life. That's how you choose to live life. But you also want to get access to a smudge and you have enough knowledge and uh, cognitive ability to be fully aware of that medicine um, and you want to use a smudge then go ahead and use a smudge. Now, other people might have a different opinion about that, but it has to do with respect and to be fully aware of this decision that you're making. Um, so if somebody came into emergency, and I know that's, it's really kind of like a, a hot issue with you present an emergency in your high on, on some type of drug and you want care, um, there's a lot of times where you're not going to get that care. And, um, and the fear is around the behavior, the erratic behavior or the um, volatile behavior. Sometimes it's not known what type of drug you're on and whether you're safe in that environment. And so you're not going to get the care that you want, or maybe someone in emergency thinks that you're drug seeking. And so they turn you away from care. But if you, you know, are an emergency and they have the capacity, meaning people and compassion, um, you might get a conversation with someone to understand why are you in emergency? Is it drug seeking? Is it because you're not really coherent? You can have a conversation to assess um, their coherence and their ability to make a decision and their ability to show respect to the medicines. Um, and so that's a, that's a very sensitive area, just like it is in emergency medicine. Um, so smudging is a medicine. And as long as there can be respect, you're coherent, you have a belief in that medicine, then you should also have the right to have access to that medicine. Now, there's limitations, um, again, um, in terms of what kind of cultural uh, practices you want to engage in. And they're largely around a person's safety. Um, I'll, I'll go, I'll say that for now. That's, I, I think the safety aspect is a really important point that it's not, it's not about perhaps being punitive and saying right. you, you don't deserve to smudge because right. you're high, um, but, but about your safety. So, and yeah, another question, how can non-Indigenous clinicians offer connections to cultural care and supports in a respectful and helpful way? I think that if you're a clinician practicing with a population where you know you're likely to have Indigenous people, then it's really important that you get to know the community that you're serving. Um, whether you're in an urban environment or whether it's a rural environment, know the community get to know who the people are and who their elders and cultural practitioners are, and then learn, you know, what is the relationship in terms of um, what a community can offer. And um, so it's understanding 
what resources are available so that you can make referrals and understand the benefits of what those referrals to elders, cultural practitioners, knowledge keepers might have uh, for an individual you're seeing. And to sort of superimpose the 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 wellness model, like again, that that speaks to relationships, not just you know, and relationships amongst community members, and as as clinicians, folks who are clinicians, and having connections with their with fellow con clinicians who may be prov providing cultural medicine or or exactly medicines. Yes, I think that's great advice. I'm curious, I, I, I do encourage everyone, please put, put your questions in the chat. Um, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit maybe to any uh, experiences that you might have had um, working with, so in, in thinking about your hub and spoke model, um, experiences you might have had working with communities that maybe were not so open to, to harm reduction. Um, how, how has that played out in your experience? Yeah. Um... There, there's a lot of misunderstanding and um, and a lack of education um, and awareness. And so it, when you think about change, change starts with a conversation. It doesn't happen all at once with one conversation. It takes time and relationships. And so um, when we're talking to communities about, their beliefs of what people need. Oftentimes communities are working from knowledge that is familiar to them. So when people think about drugs and alcohol, we have a lot of experience with alcohol. First Nations people, I mean, have a lot of experience with um, championing change around alcohol use. Now, alcohol is still number one in uh, amongst First Nations people, but we've seen significant change related to alcohol. And the change that we've seen is with whole communities. And that change started with conversations. And people will always tell you, I decided one day that was it. One decision. I've heard, you know, family, friends, other people say, you need to stop that now. And you know, all of the or else's. And and then all of a sudden, one day I just decided that was it. I can't live like this anymore. I'm going to do something different. And so that is a common point of change in community and individual stories. I made a decision and I just stopped. So that's the common knowledge. That's the common foundation that people are working from when they're talking about people who are using drugs. So we need to have patience and we need to explain the way that alcohol affects us is very different than opioids, methamphetamine, cocaine, benzodiazepines, xylazine, like all of these drugs affect us differently. People need education about those drugs. And so if you're a clinician in a community and you're providing that awareness just a little bit at a time, you're facilitating change and you're helping to build an understanding for a different way of thinking rather than just say, well, you know, people can't just go to abstinence because it's going to harm them in this way or that way. They, you need to work from where they're at and people understand um, and they have a lot of pride around the way that they have made change related to alcohol. And so the work from that foundation of pride and um, and you'll you'll build a relationship that way, um, a relationship of respect. It's a respect that a community can create change. It's acknowledging the importance of the hard work that communities have done for that change. And they can do it again, but they have to think differently about it. They have to understand how it affects us differently. And use other chronic health diseases as an example. I mean, we have a high rate of diabetes and we don't tell people with diabetes, you know, well, eat right and exercise and you'll be fine. And if you don't, no, med no medication for you. We don't say that to people who are living with diabetes. 
it's the same kind of uh, principle of compassion and relationship building that facilitates the most powerful, long-lasting, and meaningful change that is required. But it's not only internal to a community where change is required. It's also external. We need to ensure that First Nations people, no matter where they are living, on reserve, off reserve, have the benefit of the Canada Health Act, which says universal access to health care. Health care has to be available where people live. It has to be available in community. And we need everyone's voices supporting First Nations people um, with access to health care. That's a very strong call to action. And, and in, in thinking about the in um, one of the models that you show with the community as the hub, where because that is where people have access to culture. And right. in, order, in order to ensure that all of the, everything is available to all of what people need is available to them where they are. Um, I think it's a really strong point. Uh, yes, a question, RAM clinics sometimes provide fairly short-term and acute support. Are there specific uh, considerations for incorporating cultural care in the RAM setting or asks? So in, in this more short short-term, um, stabilize and the intention is for the person to move on uh, to a different setting. Yeah, I think, um, again, there has to be those community-based supports. Um, but I think the RAM clinic itself needs to present as uh, an environment that First Nations people can show up in and it's a safe environment. You're not going to be judged. You're not going to be discriminated discriminated against and so however the environment can be dressed up to say you belong here this is a safe place for you and um i think of a ram clinic like a primary health care setting so um you know this uh, the ram clinic is specific to substance dependency but people who have dependency on, on certain substances often need other health and social services. And so where are those connections? Where are the cultural supports? And so the encouragement for that, um, and perhaps those already exist, but where RAM clinics are um, can also offer access to an elder, access to uh, cultural supports, whether it's smudging or getting connection to um, your identity. Uh, oftentimes people in urban environments, um, they crave that connection to culture. And, and so if they can go to a RAM clinic and get access to their medicine um, for their substance use dependency and access to the medicine that feeds their spirit, Maybe it's about their culture. Maybe it's about their identity. Maybe it's just making a connection to an elder. Um, they'll want to come back and visit. Um, you, that's critically important. And there are clinics that even go beyond that, where they provide food. So food is medicine. So anything that can physically feed um, an individual the medicine is going to take care of the physical withdrawal symptoms. The elder is going to take care of spirit and that belonging. Um, food is really, really important um, for feeding the spirit, um, not only our physical being, but helping people to understand what kinds of foods will help um, to, you know, I know there's a lot of food insecurity with people who use drugs. And so what kinds of foods can be critical to uh, to their wellness. Um, those kinds of things are are important. At starting to practice from that holistic perspective. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And and even so, so ideally, obviously, I think every RAM clinic and and probably every clinical setting one could imagine, people would have access to elders and and right. and that and medicine bundles and so on. Even the ones that don't, though, I think even I my my thought is that even just having a clinician have an immediate like offer that to you. That's an acknowledgement of the of its importance. That's an acknowledgement. Yes, it is important. We need to make sure that you are getting your spirit fed too. Right. 
to this and the same for the food like uh you know right. jennifer's, jennifer's point about it being so appreciated by people um mm -hmm. I, I think i think that makes total sense and just an acknowledgement this is important medicine is like you know getting your buprenorphine getting your methadone your naltrexone all of those medic medicines also important but it's important food is important too and yes making sure you have access to your cultural medicines is important too right and, and that acknowledgement i would imagine can go yes away. definitely all about building relationships yes yeah i've been thinking so much and and this is this is a bit self-indulgent i have a background as a as a oh, oh before we get into that here's another question oh yes perfect sami i'm sami on my phone oh. tonight. wonderful of the inuit peoples but not not north american right find it hard a feeling of having a hole within as acknowledging myself and being acknowledged oftentimes folk ask, do you have your status right to determine whether one is legitimate i find yeah. it difficult and emotional to discuss hoping you can share a thought on this i know others in similar situations who are discovering their roots and feel imposter syndrome thank you very much Catherine, for that for that question i think it's an important one i'd love to hear uh any thoughts that you have on that i think the question is um a really good example of what hope is talking about the importance of, of your identity um, is foundational to all. That's what your spirit holds is your identity. Um, so your nationhood is what you're talking about, the land that you come from um, and, and the language. And um, whether you're Inuit, Sami, First Nations, um, who maybe has not had an opportunity to grow up knowing your culture and your identity, there will come a time in your life as you are uh, also expressing where you're seeking um, that connection, that understanding, and it's critical to wellness. Um, you describe it as, uh, you know, having a hole within there's some piece of you that is missing without that validation of your, of your identity, but it's not validation that can come from others except for your family. It's, it's, you know, researching your lineage um, to, uh, and that actually identity um, language, um, identity and lineage language um, are are key uh, to our to our wellness, as well as the land that we come from. Land, lineage, and language um, are are critical uh, to our our identity, and uh, because with without that we don't have that sense of belonging. But with it, we can facilitate um, and find our place um, where we we belong. And you know might not be in the land that you come from. Um, so I don't know if you're a Sami from Greenland, Finland, Norway, um, or Sweden, um, but there are, there are Sami people across that region. Um, but the Sami people have, oh, Sweden, okay, have very similar concepts. Um, you have similar colors um to describe the four directions um some some very similar articles uh culture-based articles that are 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 familiar uh to north american indigenous people but absolutely critically important for hope and belonging thank, thank you very much for that question and thank you for the response um it it ties in a little bit to to the to what I, the comment that I wanted to make, which was just about um, seeing recently uh, Sol Mamakwa addressing the legislature. In yes. And, and just witnessing the, the joy in that, in that moment. And, and I was just thinking about what that would have meant for the people, probably the people who were there, like I believe his parents right. who were forbidden from speaking their language, who had their language stolen from them. Right. And what a healing moment that would have been to have that opportunity to, to have it reclaimed, affirmed, celebrated. Um, yeah. And it, 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 all of his ancestors must have been yeah. celebrating over there in the spirit realm. Yes. 
Yes, very much. And and uh, the this the centrality of language uh, to 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 cultural identity, as you so beautifully said to Catherine, I think it, it is um, really. I, I was going to say I have a background as a linguist, and it's been oh. you know, being aware of of the language revitalization efforts that that continue to take place within you yes. know in, within the nations, and and that they are coming from communities themselves, and that um, one of my professors always said the goal is what you want to see is little kids playing in the language. That's right. That, that is that is um, a marker of success is when you see yes. playing in the language. Yes. Um, and and uh, the knowledge of of yeah, language, language is so so critical to wellness um, for the whole being. Um, yeah, I've just have so many different examples, but I know we don't have enough time about how language can be healing to the physical, physical uh, body, um, to the emotional, um, our emotional center, to our spirit. Yeah, our mental wellness, just lots of different stories about how language was used um, in different ways, in, including people who are disoriented because of the substances that they're using. Um, and where other people might have felt like their safety was at risk. Um, and uh, a grandmother who was helping only spoke in the language in a soft, calm tone to the individual. Uh, and then they, it was like they woke up all of a sudden. They said, oh, oh my goodness, sorry about that. I didn't know that was you, auntie. And and then went on to have a conversation about what did happen, what happened, what happened. And, but it was the language that pierced through and got through um, to that grandmother. She would say to his spirit that caused him to wake up and to say, not that he was sleeping, but to come um, to uh, be present in that moment. Um, so that she wasn't harmed and he didn't have to carry a burden of, you know, unintentionally harming her. What a remarkable story. Yeah. Well, what a beautiful way to, to uh, wrap up our webinar series uh, for the summer. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carol Hopkins for, for that wonderful presentation, for being with us tonight. Thank you to all of our attendees uh, for your for your engagement, especially on such a hot, steamy summer night. Um, we wish you all a wonderful time over the summer. We will be in touch about the, the dates for the upcoming webinars that I mentioned in the very beginning. Um, thank you all and uh, looking forward to seeing you all soon. <laughs>